So today, the Department of Communication and the Jean Beer Blumenfeld Center for Ethics are proud to bring you Dr. Lauren Walsh. Her visit with us is also made possible with the generous support of the John William Armstrong Jr. Endowment in Communication. Dr. Walsh teaches at the New School in New York City. Walsh is a frequent public speaker and appears in the media to discuss topics such as the politics and ethics of memory, photojournalism, and particularly conflict photography. Walsh is also a documentarian on related themes. Among Walsh's publications are several books. The most recent ones include Conversations on Conflict Photography, which brings to readers several dialogues with award-winning combat photographers and readers can then consider the function of combat photography and assess their own responses to it. And another recent publication by Walsh is Through the Lens. This book is hot off the presses, just from a couple of weeks ago. And the book uses recent social and political crises, such as the pandemic and Black Lives Matter, to think about the role of photography in shaping our social, political, and personal understandings. After today's session, we'll have an informal meet and greet and book signing where you can visit with Dr. Walsh and get one of those recent and compelling works. And after the book signing, please stick around for more informal conversation where you can get some midday <coughs> snacks that will be available courtesy of the Department of Communication. So today, we are delighted that Dr. Walsh visits with us to discuss some of her continuing work on photojournalism. Her topic for today's presentation is photojournalism in a world of crisis. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Walsh. Hey everybody, thank you um, Dr. Atkinson, thank you Dr. Cohen for the introductions um, and thank you everybody for joining today. Um, when I came up with this title, it was probably early January, I was emailing with someone in the department. I hadn't met anyone in person yet, so the names weren't quite sticking. And I thought, okay, photojournalism in a world of crisis this is what I specialize in. And little could I have anticipated at that moment the enormous geopolitical crisis that we are witnessing and kind of living through, but from afar right now. And of course, I'm referring to Russia and Ukraine. So I decided to structure my talk today, or the original plan was, I'm just going to use those two recent books that Dr. Cohn was just referencing, and I'll walk us through some of the themes and issues explored in those books. But before I even get to those books, I want to talk a bit about what's happening in the world today. So I also note, before I get into the talk proper, there are some images in my slideshow that are heavy, graphic, upsetting. Um, it kind of is par for the course when you specialize in conflict photography. I still find it helpful to give audiences a heads up that this is the kind of imagery we'll be looking at. So what I have here, um, February 3, 2022, it feels like eons ago if you're like me and you're like a news junkie and every single day you're like, what's happening? What's the latest step in the invasion? February 3 feels like a long time ago. But here's a headline. Russia plans very graphic fake video as pretext for Ukraine invasion. And this is the subhead. It ran in The Guardian. I picked this example. Um, since February 3rd, I could have picked a few examples of Russia using visuals that are faked. Um, in this case, of course, and how many of you remember hearing about this? I mean, it's kind of crazy making up a video to launch an invasion. That wasn't actually what happened as it came to pass. It wasn't a faked video that started the invasion. It rolled forward anyway. But the point that I want to make with this and with other examples, how many of you have heard about the deep fake with Zelensky allegedly surrendering? Also, a faked visual. right? So my point is visuals have enormous power, enormous power to shape the course of history, in this case, almost to start an invasion. OK, so I'm going to walk us through this. Power can be used towards bad or good. In some regards, I know that these are really simplified terms, bad, good. It sounds a little bit like I'm talking about like a superhero story or a fairy tale, where kind of the morality is either really this way or really that way. For my purposes, when I say that images, 
and I'm talking about photojournalistic images, when I say that they can be used towards good, what I'm really referencing is, of course, that they're not faked, that they're not propaganda moving towards a disinformation campaign, and that, of course, they're not faked and used to start an invasion. And by contrast, when we talk about photojournalism, the expectation is that the imagery is credible, it's truthful, it's authentic, it is representative of what is really happening. So that is one of the issues I want to talk about today. Another is the role that journalism serves in maintaining democracy. And I know there are some students here. Can I get a sense of how many students are journalism students? OK, a few of you. I fundamentally believe that you are entering into a profession that is vital, vital to democracy. And I'm sure everyone else in this room is studying very important work as well. I think, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, you can't actually have a productive democracy if you don't have a free and independent press. I also want to talk about some of the risks that journalists, for my purposes, photojournalists, face to bring us the news and pictures, and some of the risks that journalism as an entire profession is facing on many fronts. And then finally, what I'll try to talk about today is some of the reactions that we have when we look at images, whether they're from Ukraine or whether they're from Atlanta. What do we do with this knowledge? What are some of the considerations we should be thinking about? What went into this image and what do I do in reaction to it? Okay, so just to set the landscape a little further, I'm not going to read this whole quote. This is by a researcher. Her name is Carolyn Lees. It was published in 2018, so it's a few years old. And the point that I want to make here, and I'll let everyone read the quote, is many, 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 many countries around the world have cracked down on journalism. And often they're using the term fake news or false news as a way of discrediting journalism, right? Sometimes things are fake, right? Like a faked video to start an invasion. But the vast majority of the time that authoritarian leaders are using the term fake news is when they want to discredit or silence the press. And they do this by undermining the role that journalism serves in society. If you call it fake news, you call it into question, you harass the press, you get the press to stop working, you threaten the press, or worse in places, you kill the press. That means things go silent. This is what we're watching in Russia right now. So again, I said I wanted to structure this through my books. I really want to take the opportunity to say these are not academic books, and these are not in the abstract. This is happening right now in the news that you're watching. So Putin has strangled any notion of a free press. So as of last month, the country's independent media went off the air. Social media platforms have been blocked. And again, I see students in this room. How many of you get any form of news from social media? Yeah. I do too. Um, I also go straight to New York Times and Washington Post, but I get some of it off social media as well. So that's off the table, right? There is no social media access to get your information. And then just recently, there was a new law passed, and anyone spreading quote unquote false information is punishable by up to 15 years in prison. Nobody wants to face a 15 year prison sentence in Russia. And if we think about what constitutes false information? It's things like referring to the war as an invasion, which it is, as opposed to calling it a liberation, which is what Russia is saying it is. So this is a really dangerous landscape. And what it allows is for the Kremlin, for Putin, to control the narrative. Whatever is happening outside of Russia, whatever is really happening, is not being told to a Russian public. So photojournalists, among other journalists, play an important role in combating this kind of censorship. And I specialize in photojournalism for a number of reasons. I think we live in an image-dominated world. I think we do much of our communication through images. And photos bring a level of witness and visuality and, frankly, evidence to a story that's going on. So they serve an incredibly important role. OK, so with that as my setup for why does this matter, I'm going to walk backwards into my books. So this one came out about two years ago called Conversations on Conflict Photography. And we got a little bit of a setup from Dr. Cohen. It's really a deep dive into 
What is conflict photography? Why does it matter? How do the images get created? How do they get distributed? What do I, the news consumer here in, well, typically New York, right now Atlanta, what do I do in response to these images? And it's structured as a series of interviews with photographers who cover conflict around the world and with photo editors who are making decisions like, I'll let my public see this image. I will not let the public see that image. So they're acting as a filter. And this is something that the public should understand. I structured it as interviews because there are a few essays by me, but really I wanted it to be a very accessible read. And I think hearing the voices of the photographers and the voices of the editors brings these stories and these issues to life. So what I'm going to do now is walk us through a few of the themes that I track in the book. And those themes include things like physical dangers, emotional injury, censorship, um, and even like what's the value of an image in the age of Instagram and TikTok. OK, so physical dangers. Um, I have a few screens here that are heavy with text. I'll read the text to us. Um, but before I even read the text, I'm just going to preface by saying there have already been a number of journalists who've died in Ukraine, right, for those who are following closely. It's not really a stretch of the imagination to say someone's in a war zone. There are bullets. There are bombs. There's shrapnel. They are in physical danger, right? This is the, we can compute this. This makes sense. Even so, journalists will go into war zones in order to document so that the world can be aware of what's happening. So here's one example from the book. The photographer is French. His name is Laurent van der Stockt. He's in actually Ukraine right now. And he's referencing a war that occurred, oh, about 30 years ago. So he's been working for a while. And he says, I was in Vukovar the first time I was injured. Vukovar is in a country called Croatia. It was quite scary because many people around me were killed. I was with a Croatian unit covering some fighting against Serb forces. We were hit by mortars. My arm was badly shredded up by shrapnel. I had to get myself to the hospital. I was afraid my arm was going to come off, just fall on the floor as I drove. It was in bad shape for a hospital, so I was truly scared and was afraid they were going to amputate my arm. I begged them not to cut it off. They patched me up, and then I had to get out of Vukovar. An amazing ambulance driver drove me out of there and then onto another ambulance, then to a helicopter, and so on. Eventually, I had surgery in France, and all told, it took nearly two years to rebuild my arm. A few weeks after I left Vukovar, Serb forces entered the city and killed all the men in the hospital. Every wounded male was considered a soldier. That whole thing, it was a very bad experience. Right, so this is a, it's a pretty dramatic story, but this guy has actually been injured, I think, four times very seriously. I'm going to show you an image, not from Vukovar, but this is the photographer where he was shot another time. He somehow is like a cat with nine lives and keeps surviving this, but the dangers are real. I think one of the things that we don't tend to think about as much, in part because it doesn't bleed outwardly, there's no broken bones, but there are a lot of emotional injuries that come with the job of witnessing death, of witnessing enormous vulnerability, of witnessing destruction and grief on these levels. So I'm going to read you a quote from another photographer in the book. His name is Marcus Bleasdale. He's done a lot of work in the Central African Republic and the, Dem and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And he says, I've learned that you carry a lot of this with you. The sorrows add up, so you have to talk to someone professional who can help you deal with these experiences and help you process them into your life. Not so that they disappear, but so that they don't destroy you. You cannot see five or ten killings a day and expect to process that on your own. The photographers who think that a bottle of whiskey will fix things are fools. And what he's referring to in that final sentence is something of a tradition within war journalism, which is to say whiskey as a kind of self-medication, right? Or fill in with your alcohol or fill in with your drug. This is historically an industry especially for war reportage that is more male than not. It's a very, or has been traditionally, a very male culture, a macho culture. And the idea of a photographer saying, I'm suffering, I'm hurting, I can't sleep, I have nightmares, I'm depressed, I'm crying, was really not on the table for a very long time. It's only been very recently that some studies have shown that 
war photojournalists experience PTSD at the exact same rate as soldiers who witness combat or are part of combat operations. It's about 29, 30% suffer PTSD. And it's only really been recently that newsrooms are starting to protect for this, right? They're talking about it, they're aware of it, they're taking preventative measures, and then, and even I'm, I'm listening to this live right now with Ukraine. There are editors who are telling their photojournalists, we're rotating you out, it's too much, you've been there for three weeks, you need a break, right? So newsrooms are more conscious of this stuff now. The emotional tolls don't just happen in crises that are far away, Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ukraine. This is a picture from, um, and I think many of you in the room were pretty young when this happened, but there was a school shooting in Connecticut where a number of kindergartners and I think first graders were murdered. And here is what a photographer says about that. How do you ever get over the Newtown shooting? I'd say on average, three days don't go by without me thinking about that in some capacity. I think about those kids, about their families, where they are now, about how I was sent there to cover that story, but also how I wanted to avoid it. I didn't want to go, you just don't want to be part of the human race in that moment. But I was assigned to cover it and had to go. So I think there's a lot, and what I try to do with this book and with these talks is to bring you behind the camera to understand what is happening with these photojournalists. Another one of the themes that I explore, I titled it Whose Stories Get Told, and I think I really should have titled it Whose Stories Don't Get Told. Um, I'll let you read the caption. The photographer's name is Shahidul Alam. He's a Bangladeshi photographer, and he's done an enormous amount of work for photojournalism in that region of the world. And what he has to say is, traditionally, Western media outlets looked at my country, Bangladesh, or countries like my country, as a space where they would just report on disaster, poverty, malnutrition, famine, right? There was no other nuance to these stories. And he says it's a total simplification, right? He says there's so much more going on in my country, why doesn't it ever get reported? And here's what he says. What is never mentioned is that the biggest support structure by far in a country like Bangladesh are the families themselves. And he's referring to the little girl in that image. So here is this incredible story of generosity with this little girl, yet no one was interested in it. I have pictures of her joining her new family and finding food. Perhaps they were not dramatic enough. They certainly won't win many awards, but I think they're an important part of the story, which in this particular case didn't get told. One image ran in the New York Times, but not this entire story about a local support structure. This is one of many other pictures that was published, each dealing with a different aspect. Again, simplification. Right? So he pushes back against that idea and says, we have an entire society here. Why is it not being represented? Another one of the themes, and I have to say, this is maybe like a go-to theme when I teach courses on conflict photography, is this relationship between kind of visual beauty and the content of suffering. And so very often my students will say, I don't understand how can a photographer think about color, composition, light, when you're documenting someone's worst moment? Like, how can you possibly do that? And then I'll also have students who will say, much more critically, how dare you? How dare you make something beautiful of someone's worst moment? And so here's what photographer Ron Haviv says. This is a highly aesthetic photo that doesn't play into the usual American perceptions of disheveled, displaced persons. But there's something going on with this girl and you don't know what. She's beautiful, she's holding herself in a very dignified manner, she's dressed in an amazing way. You'll have a connection to her through the aesthetics, through the beauty of what's going on, and you'll want to know more, which can only come across in this particular case with a caption. But that said, when you do find out what she's doing and who she is, you've already built up a relationship with her, and then you think, oh my god, this poor girl, she's about to walk with her two friends to look for firewood, where obviously there's no firewood. She's a displaced person, she's in Darfur, she's in the middle of a genocide, and so on. There are times when the caption is imperative, I'm fine with that, but I'll use aesthetics to pull you in. Um, I mentioned before, this is another theme, I mentioned before uh, it's a male-dominated field traditionally. What I can really say is it is a Western white male-dominated field. Um, and so with my last book on conflict photography and my newer book on the pandemic and Black Lives Matter, I went out of my way to explode that history, right? And to give voice to a diversity of practitioners um, from around the world, different ethnic backgrounds, men and women. 
So here is a photographer named Iman Hilal. She's based in Egypt, and she talks about how hard it is trying to rise up as a female photojournalist in a patriarchal society. The editors trust men more, and they consider them more qualified than women to cover clashes. Most of our bosses are men, and they believe that journalism is a man's job. So during the early days of the revolution, the editor-in-chief announced that women could take a vacation because he was afraid to take responsibility and to believe in women journalists. So the newspaper sent male photographers, and I really fought against, against that. I worked beyond my shift just to show them that I can do this too. And she's kind of got it doubly stacked against her. She's a woman, and then she's also trying to break into an international scene, and she's Egyptian. Right? This is not known as a country for its photojournalism, so she's really had to work very hard to make it out of, that, out of that, uh, those limits. OK, those were a few of the themes in that book. I wanted to just throw out a bunch of here, we can talk about this, we can think about this. These are things to be aware of. I also want to do a similar thing and walk us quickly through some of the themes in this new book. Um, so it's called Through the Lens, The Pandemic and Black Lives Matter. It came out last month. And largely what I did with this book was I take 2020 as my year of focus. Two major stories that year, right? the pandemic. And Black Lives Matter has existed prior to 2020, but in the wake of the George Floyd murder, the protests exploded. So to put this in context of why I think 2020 was such a historic year, the pandemic is a once in a century epidemiological catastrophe. And the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020 were the largest in United States history, and in large part due to the media coverage that they received, it became a global phenomenon with protests around the world. This year also witnessed new risks, new challenges, new ethical questions, new threats towards journalists and journalism broadly. So that's what I wanted to explore in this. Again, it's structured as a series of interviews to take you inside the experiences of the photographers and the photo editors. Okay, so censorship. Um, I already gave us an example at the beginning with Putin. Censorship is not new to 2022. It was not new to 2020. Censorship has existed for a long time. Cutting off people's access to information is a very powerful way to take control. Nevertheless, 2020 witnessed a massive spike in censorship around the world because all those governments that I showed, or all those countries that I showed us before in that quote with fake news, they all seized on this as an opportunity to make a kind of blanket excuse. We're gonna restrict journalists' access. Right, so you can see here, 73% of the countries that were analyzed by Reporters Without Borders had problematic environments for press freedom. This is one single headline that I pulled from the New York Times, no negative news, how China censored the coronavirus. Um, and I pulled this one in particular because one of the interviews that I conducted for my book was with a Chinese photographer who was covering in Wuhan. We all remember Wuhan outbreak of the virus. And I'm going to show you his words because I can't show you his image. Word that journalists were in the COVID facility in Wuhan got out to local law enforcement and a couple police cars plus 20 policemen and some politicians showed up at the facility. They tried to coerce me into deleting my photos. For 10 hours, we were in a doctor's office in the COVID facility arguing with local law enforcement. Ultimately, the images were lost. The police formatted my SD card. The photos were wiped. Right, so these are the kinds of threats and dangers that photojournalists are facing in certain countries. He goes in, he documents, police show up and basically wipe the images by formatting his SD card. I also spoke to a photojournalist who is based in Peru. His name is Rodrigo Abd. There was a lot of censorship in Peru as well. It took a different form. It wasn't police showing up, detaining you for 10 hours, taking your camera, and wiping the images, it was a little more subtle. I'm gonna read his quote and then give you some context. For the journalists here, it was easy to see that the government's numbers were false. For example, they announced 100 people died yesterday, and I know the true number is higher because I'm with the private workers who are collecting the dead, and we see 30 deaths in just one sector of Lima while people are dying all over the city and the country, and communities in the jungle were getting hit really hard just then. So the number had to be higher than the 100 the government was reporting. Okay, so he's saying there's underreporting occurring. I did this interview with him in fall of 2020. So fast forward to June 2021, 
the Peruvian government finally, officially, publicly acknowledges that they have vastly underreported their COVID death rate. Right, so he was calling it nine months in advance. Turns out Peru had the highest per capita COVID mortality rate in the entire world. They had one of the highest excess death rates in the entire world. And the interesting thing to understand about this, see here it says AP next to his name. He is a photographer with the Associated Press. It's an international wire service. His images are very largely seen out and around the world and not in Peru. So the population that could have benefited most from this information was not getting this information. Right? So the journalists knew it and the government was denying it. Danger, All right, I spoke about this with that quote from the French photographer who had his arm nearly blown off. Um, danger isn't new to being a journalist, but it is kind of new to being a journalist in the United States. We have no active war, truly war, on our soil right now. And by and large, organizations around the world didn't historically, or even up until about three years ago, consider the United States such a dangerous place to be a journalist. 2020 shifted. Um, the Committee to Protect Journalists saw unprecedented attacks against representatives of the press. And what I'm going to explain to us in a little bit is these attacks were coming from all sides. They were coming from people who consume the news, and they were coming from uh, law enforcement authorities as well. And I added this in here because um, for those of us who do kind of geopolitical work, it's a big deal that the International Crisis Group in 2020 put the United States on its list, right? That they were so worried about political violence here and particularly violence directed towards journalists. Okay, so here's a picture. Um, it's from one of the protests in Philadelphia. You can see that things are pretty volatile there. And here is a quote from Denise Keenan. She's the director of video and photography at the Philadelphia Inquirer. I had one photojournalist call me, my arms are on fire, I'm burning. My response was, get out of there. He had burns from some chemical irritant. I had another photographer call and say, someone just took my cameras. He continued working on his cell phone, but it didn't feel safe to me, so again, my response was, get out of there. I found out the next day he had been smashed over the head, and then they took one of his camera bodies and broke the other. This is all on the same day, so it's kind of a blur. I had another photographer on site. She was good for a while. We were on the phone, going back and forth, doing check-ins. Then she called and said, they just took my cameras and my laptop. She was trying to chase them down. My reaction, again, was about safety, and I told her to leave. Right, so these photographers, three, in a pretty small department, photography department, three get attacked in one single day by people who are showing up to the protests and are there pretty much to get the press, right? Injuring them and destroying their equipment. The really interesting thing is, Denise Keenan says, I'm in Philadelphia. This is a middle-sized city. I've never seen violence like this before. I've never seen violence like this against my journalists before. No one is prepared for this. And she's got a range of photographers working from her. Some of them are seasoned, and they've been doing this for a while. Others are young. They're just out of college. And she was terrified. She's like, they, they don't have training for this. So within the space of about a day, she had to get them via Zoom, right? because this is pandemic life, what's called hostile environment training. So journalists who are going into conflict zones will always do something called hostile environment training. And it teaches you first aid. It teaches you how to react under extreme stress. It teaches you about psychological stress. She had to get that to her journalists in the space of about one day, and the attacks continued rolling forward over time. I also mentioned that there was an enormous amount of harassment of the press coming from law enforcement. This was also a spike in 2020. For those of you who attended protests or certainly heard about it, you know, many of them were calling for things like defund the police. There was an enormous amount of antagonism between protesters and police. And a lot of that was also getting taken out on the press by the police. Now, press is there not as an activist. They are there as documentarians and as witnesses, and they are not supposed to be threatened by the police ever. Nevertheless, this is a quote from Marion Golan. She's the director of photography at the Washington Post. We had photographers who were arrested while on assignment, for instance, in Minneapolis. In one case, our photographer Joshua Lott was kettled, swept up with other journalists and protesters. He told the officers at least six times he was a journalist with the Washington Post. Finally, someone listened and called a higher ranking officer who said that as a journalist, he must be released. But meanwhile, Joshua had been confined and his hands had been bound with heavy duty zip ties. 
That shouldn't have happened. He was covering as a journalist, not there as a protester. Joshua was harassed another time, too. Maybe it's a coincidence that Joshua is African American and this happened specifically to him, but I doubt it. Eventually, he was pulled over. A journalist colleague in the car behind also stopped to make sure Joshua would be all right. The officer told Joshua he was driving in circles, and that's why he pulled him over. Meanwhile, another officer stepped out of the cruiser and approached the second vehicle, the one that was being driven by Lot's colleague, and he stood there with his long gun prominently out. That's terrifying. I selected this passage um, largely for this line by Marianne Golan where she says, maybe it's a coincidence that he was African American and this is happening to him, but I doubt it. Many studies have shown that 2020 was dangerous for journalists, full stop, and really dangerous for journalists of color. And here she is talking through that. One or two other topics that, the, that I'll talk about today that the book touches on is this question of what do we see, right? What has visibility and what doesn't? And so on the one hand, if these are the two biggest stories, one of them is actually invisible, right? It's a virus. Unless you're looking with a microscope, you can't see the virus. And the other is about these protests, which inherently protests need visibility. That's what gives them power, right? The bigger the protest, kind of the more attention it gets, the louder the demands are heard. And yet 2020 witnessed a whole host of new concerns around privacy and visibility. And I'll walk us through just one or two of them. So on the one hand, there are a number of people who started questioning why American media was not showing us the really severe graphic images of COVID suffering from inside hospitals. Right, and so what they mean is, where are the pictures of people who are intubated? Where are the pictures of people who are dying? Where are the pictures inside morgues? If you remember, kind of go back to spring of 2020, the vast majority of news imagery was face shields, masks, gloves, and empty streets, right? To signify, we're in a shutdown, we're in a lockdown, this is the way you visualize it. But these people were saying, if we could show the public the real severity of this virus, will a broader percentage of the public take this more seriously? Now, one thing to understand is there are privacy regulations in the United States that restrict the media's access inside a hospital, right? Like you're in a hospital, you don't necessarily want your photo out. You don't necessarily want your name and your identity out there. But the critics come back to that and they say, yes, but under the Trump administration, a lot of those privacy regulations were loosened, but the media constraints were not loosened. Okay, so this is one thing we can think about is this kind of dilemma happening. And then on the other hand, if we go back to BLM for a moment, despite a very long tradition of public protest in the United States, how many of you can think in your mind of at least some civil rights era photography? Okay, so I see a few hands. Those of you who know that imagery know that it's really powerful at times because you see people's eyes, you see their faces, you see anger, you see anguish, you see emotion, right? But for the first time in US history, photographers were routinely facing demands from people at demonstrations that they not take pictures of their faces. This stems from, and I'm sure many of you have heard about this, it stems from new concerns about updated surveillance technologies that can read identity into images. And the protester concern was, what if the police use your image to find my identity, to track me down, to target me, to harass me, to arrest, arrest me? So now you have photojournalists in this strange position because legally, if you're in a public space, generally protests happen in public spaces, it is legally your right to take the picture any way you want, you're in a public space. And at the same time, you have protesters saying, don't do this, you're gonna put me at risk. And these photojournalists are now kind of in this mindset of, do I take the picture, do I not take the picture? I'm gonna walk us forward through that as well. Okay, so this, if I'm doing these kind of side by side, in terms of COVID, this is a photograph by a photographer, Spencer Platt. In the book, he talks about how he tried again and again and again to get media access inside hospitals. He's based in New York City. It was a global hotspot. I mean, we were, I'm from New York. We were one of the cities where there was so much death that there were the refrigerator trucks set up outside hospitals to put the bodies in because they couldn't handle the flow of bodies, right? He didn't get media access. So what he talks about is, I staked out outside of hospitals. I stood on public property and I took pictures of patients as they were taking them out of ambulances. 
And he says, I tried my best to protect the privacy. Like in this image, you probably can't tell who that woman is. And he said, but I can't guarantee that I, did, that I protected privacy in every case. And his final point was, there is an overriding need for the public to understand how severe this is. And with hospitals not letting me in, I have to do what I can to do my job. If we go back to the Black Lives Matter and questions of visibility and privacy, photographed by a photographer named Nina Berman. She talks about going to a protest in New York City. And the organizer approached the media who were there and said, don't take pictures of faces. She says that many of her colleagues uh, in the press pretty much said, part of my language, pretty much said, like, screw you. This is my job. I have a legal right to be here. I have a professional, I have to do this. Right? My role is to take pictures, is to document, is to create evidence, is to show the world what is happening right now. I'm not going to change my pictures. Nina Berman says, I understand my legal right. I also don't want to be a photographer who puts anyone in harm's way. So I'm going to try to take pictures from a different vantage. I'm going to try to do it a different way. And what she says about this is, I hope this image conveys the scope of the size of the protest. I hope this image conveys the sense of purpose and the unity among protesters. And she talks about how traditionally this would not be a lead photo. The lead photo would have faces, right? It would have expressions, it would have emotions. But she decided to use this as her lead photo. OK, and then I think this is the final topic I want to touch on as one of the many topics I address in the book. Um, and I'll pre preface by saying I so fundamentally believe in the role of journalism and photojournalism. And in places, like there's a city right now in Ukraine where they pulled the last two, uh, last two foreign journalists were pulled out a few days ago because they were actually on a target list, a Russian target list. So we now have no international media disseminating imagery or news from Mariupol, Ukraine. And that, to me, is terrifying, because that's the space where horrific things happen, where war crimes happen, where you can never hold someone accountable, where you can never prosecute them because there's no evidence. Right? So I really stand by the role that photojournalism serves. And yet there's limits to what a photograph can do. And the really basic limit is just it's a, it's a photo, right? Like what happened before it? What happened after it? What's right outside the frame? In some regards, it's an extremely limited medium. One of the photographers that I interviewed, her name is Patience Zalonga, and she talks about the limits of photography in another way. She says, one of the hardest things with photojournalism is the captions. You have the traditional who, what, where, when, but nobody really says the why to explain what is happening. I mean to really piece it together. I ask myself, who gets to decide what is objective? Who gets to say what is neutral? Who gets to say what is factual? Or rather, which facts matter enough to report? And pretty much what she's saying, and for those who are not studying photojournalism, a standard photojournalistic caption is exactly what she says. It's one sentence. It's who, what, where, when. It's basically the verbal description of what you're looking at in the picture. Sometimes there'll be a second sentence that'll give you a little bit more. But her point is, if photojournalism is so important, right, if we look to images to show us what's happening in the world, why don't we take the opportunity to put more context right next to the image? And then I'm going to end with a photo by Patience Zalonga, um, because I think it's a very beautiful photo, and I really like the way she talks about it. She says, more often than not, and she's not wrong, news media tends to go for spectacle. Right, for the murder, for the bomb, for the fire, for whatever is spectacular. And what she says is, if you really want to understand what's happening in society, you also have to look at the quiet moments. And so the way she talks about this picture is, you can see, it's a father and a son. They're sitting in George Floyd's square. It's the place where George Floyd was murdered, and it was turned into essentially a memorial, um, a space for people to go and remember George Floyd. And she says, this is not your typical picture of a black man, the way it gets seen in the news. This is a man sitting with his son in a space where another black man was violently murdered. And here is a loving, tender portrayal. And I want people to look at images like this. And I hope it deepens the context of Black Lives Matter in the United States today. So I'm going to give her the final word on that. And I'll wrap us up. I think the only other point that I would like to make, since I've been talking at us for a while, is on a yearly basis, 1.4 trillion images are created. They're obviously not all news images. Um, and it only takes like half a second on Instagram to understand that. But 
we live in an image dominated world. I think I said it at the beginning, I think images are a dominant form of communication. I would almost go so far as to say they rival the written word. Right? We use images to tell stories, to convey information, to communicate how we're doing, to show where we've been, to document our lives, to document other people's lives. So for me, with this talk, with these books, it's so critically important to just get us to understand even a little more deeply what are images? How do they work? And then I, of course, am particularly Im interested in images of conflict or crisis. What are the extra added layers we need to think about in terms of what's happening behind the camera lens? Who makes the decision about the images that reach us? And then what are some of the ethical considerations we can think about when we look at the images? So thank you for listening. Should we see if there are any questions? I got a thumbs up. Any questions that I can field from anyone? Talk to me a little bit about what you think photographs and photojournalism does for audiences. Um, you know, what are we supposed to, uh, to, to take away when we look at pictures? What do they do? Um, and, and that's a very big question, so we have narrow it. So, um, but like, so you, like you talked about images, documenting. Yeah. Right. They I'll provide documentary evidence. Uh, and you also say that uh, they should be truthful and credible, right? Uh, they should tell us how it's happening. But at the same time, it seems like there are also some images that maybe are more beneficial for us as audiences to look at, uh, or maybe might serve other purposes. And so like, I'm thinking especially about that last image that, that you showed us, which is like one particular way of framing uh, a family story, a uh, story about black masculine. There are a lot of ways we could talk about that. I mean, I guess what, what makes an image like that a good image for us to look at? Is there an argument that an image like that makes that that matters for us? Uh, what kind of images should we be looking at? Thank you for the question. Um, I think it's a tough question because there's so, in my mind, there's so many different layers of news. Um, and a breaking news story would have a certain kind of image and it probably wouldn't have this because it's not like what's the breaking news here. Um, what I do think that journalism in the US and generally doesn't do nearly as well is a journalism that takes into account the systemic structures that led to the spectacular breaking news photo, right? Like we, we all know there was a nine and a half minute video granted by a citizen journalist of George Floyd's murder, right? And that did make the rounds. That is breaking news. It is spectacle. You can imagine equivalent versions by professional photojournalists. Um, but that video and the immediate journalism that was coming out after that video wasn't about what's the colonial history in the United States. Why, how does this actually connect to a much longer, deeper history? How does, I mean, parts of the book even, and particularly Patience Salonga takes this up, COVID and, and being black in the United States were completely intertwined. So I think it's just, it's kind of a mini answer. I, there's so many directions I could go in with this. I think what our journalism needs to do more of is long form, quieter. And I think we need to teach and train the public that these kinds of images are as important as the spectacular images and that there is news value to them because the value is understanding a local community or a broader society better. You know, looking at your background, just prior to this a few weeks ago, you had, there was something you had written about Dorothea Lang's photo, Microfather, I think it was that, was that Dorothea Lang, is that right? And, you know, it strikes me, you know, in a way, it's it's a touching photo the way this is a touching photo, right? That photo really, really resonated, obviously, over time. And uh, I have this pandemic uh, Facebook page for journalists about uh, covering the pandemic and other crises. And so I just post interesting links. And so some time ago, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York did a Dorothea Lang exhibit and posted a video about why certain images re resonate. And it was just something, you know, in that video that for me felt like this applies, you know, today. And it was not long after that, the New York Times, I think, did a story on where are the photos of the COVID crisis, as you pointed out. And I think it's a very important issue. I mean, it's, we're really not seeing the depth of magnitude because of HIPAA and 
I guess for a variety of other reasons. You know, if we remember those aerial shots of them digging mass graves in New York, a mass grave. I mean, that to me was compelling. That to me was almost the closest I felt. And then some of these videos from the hospital where people are saying their last words on video. Yeah, and with those mass graves, they shut down the drone access pretty immediately um, as a way of keeping imagery from coming out. I mean, I think with the Dorothea Lang, the other, you're right, it's another kind of quiet moment. Um, I mean, I would point out it is a white woman, uh, and there were many black sharecroppers at this moment in history experiencing the same hardships that she was, and their photos didn't get that prominence. I think also in 1936 when the picture was taken and published, it was just a, such a, like the media landscape and who had the, you know, it was published in, it was published in a local paper in California and then it gets picked up. And there's so many fewer media outlets that there's the much quicker possibility for one image to become a very well-known image and to get replayed and replayed. Whereas, I mean, this is an image that, and I, it's unfortunate and Patience Salonga is correct, it would get lost on Instagram in a second. Um, whereas, you know, we've had points in our history where Life magazine is the dominant magazine and like 12% of the American public was getting all of their news from Life magazine, which is a huge percentage for one source. So I think, I mean, I think you're, you're right that that image, it is one of those quiet moments. It's nice. I never thought of that before and I do like that as the the father-son version of the of the mother-children photo. Yeah. Um, something that I think was important that you mentioned was that I mean the world of photojournalism is very Western, very white male, and it's something that we honestly talked about in Dr. Wade's class, where even in photojournalism, where you have your camera and you can point and click the camera, but there's still some sort of bias from just like who is the person pointing and shooting it. What do you think? I mean, obviously, any bias in journalism can be detrimental in some aspects, but for photojournalism and like telling the story of national and international crises, what are the parts of it being so Western white male that are detrimental in, like, to the overall storytelling, do you think? Uh, well, I think you, your, your question almost said some of the parts that are detrimental, right? Like, if you're... And let's say, you know, and I do think the vast majority of photojournalists who are flying somewhere else to cover some crisis, I think the vast majority of them have good intentions, right? Like something is going wrong in this part of the world and I have the ability to document it and to make this story known. I think even with good intentions, you're still an outsider to someone else's situation. You still could get things wrong. You're still completely, if you're in a country where you don't speak the language, completely dependent on someone local to do translation for you. And, uh, you know, things get lost in translation. Historically, there were a lot more problems than there are today. This has been addressed a lot more in recent journalism. But the idea of a Western photographer and the phrase that always gets used is parachuting in, kind of parachuting in, taking some pictures, often pictures that feed a kind of stereotypical perspective. There's a a pretty horrifying story in my book, Conversations on Conflict Photography, about a photographer who is, um, he's from Zimbabwe. Right? He's a black photographer from Zimbabwe, and he worked as a wire service photographer all around Africa. He was stationed in a few different countries. And he says, first of all, he talks about endemic racism in the industry and how he was consistently passed over for jobs that went to his white colleagues who were not even from the local countries. But he also says that you get into this mindset where you're looking for the picture that your editor wants. And he was covering a famine and he walked into a feeding center and he started taking the stereotypical pictures of, you know, like children with empty plates and sad eyes and distended be bellies because when you're malnourished, that's a thing that happens to your body. And he had to stop himself and kind of leave the space and clear his head and say, I don't want to give in to that kind of stereotype. So I think there's there's that, there's a pressure coming from editors, there's the idea from photojournalists that even sometimes they're like, 
I know this is a stereotype, but it'll resonate with a foreign audience faster. So is it better for me to take the stereotypical picture, or is it worse because I'm perpetuating a stereotype? I think those are just some of the potential cons. The, the one thing I will say is, for journalists who are foreign and covering in spaces of conflict or crisis, there are times when it is, in some regards, better for the foreigner to be there because it is just too dangerous for the local. And the local will be hunted down for reporting. And essentially, like the risks of death are high in some countries. And it is in the, those situations, it's actually better to say, all right, this is an outsider who may not know as well, but it's safer for this person to go in, create some imagery, and then leave. Uh, I guess with the prevalence of like Photoshop and being able to, I guess, edit images, um, what are your thoughts on some editors or I guess journalists that do potentially insert things other than like you know color correction and uh, cropping into images to make them more impactful? There's um, and it's not just Photoshop, right? Like there's a host of. There's a set of guidelines that most, uh, let's say at least, American photojournalists are expected to adhere to in terms of how much you can manipulate the image. By and large, it's pretty little what you're supposed to be doing to the image. You know, the general rule of thumb is never, ever, ever change it in a way that actually kind of changes the story of what is happening. Um, I mean, you're not supposed to be like boosting color to make it prettier. You can remove some dust maybe that was on a sensor, but you're not really supposed to be doing that much um, photo, yeah, post-production on your images. Yeah. I was curious. I really enjoyed the your the way you were talking and that about giving voice to the actual photojournalists. And I was just curious if any of your conversations, they talk about the kind of pressures they're under to circulate their images, and are aware in their minds about the kind of competition that legacy press faces from the profusion of channels, the idea that stories can be told multimodally, um, the idea that algorithms drive by balls and that there are certain path dues in these images. Just curious if that ever came up. It would be really hard to do this work <laughs> on its own. Um, yeah, it's, um, again, for the, for the future journalists in the room, it's not like a super easy industry, and they are aware of these. Um, it's particularly, I mean, yeah, legacy media is shrinking because, largely because the public is not paying for subscriptions anymore. So there's, I don't know what the exact breakdown is. I would say the percentage of freelance to staff, freelance is going to way outpace staff at this moment. Um, from my perspective, that raises so many other concerns because the freelancer doesn't have insurance. The freelancer has to go and pay for the hostile environment training. The freelancer has to get all their own gear. And that is so expensive. Um, and I, just to put it into perspective, I had a conversation with a, a young-ish freelancer. He was like 26 years old and showed up in Ukraine with not only no flak jacket, which protects you, not, no helmet, no training, but he didn't even have what you could buy at a drug store. He didn't even have a medical kit. Um, and it was so distressing to me, and it took like three days of convincing him to leave, because that's just a recipe for disaster. So yeah, I think, um, I think they are aware and terrified of all that. There's also a pressure on photojournalists to be a brand and to have like as many clicks and likes as they can, which is a strain. Like, Journalism should be journalism. It should be there for one purpose, and the purpose shouldn't be branding. But they're very aware of the fact that the greater my following, the more likely I'll get an assignment from the next publication. Wow, I really enjoy your talk and the important work that you're doing. Thank you. Um, uh, I teach a class that's our media ethics class. and. Um, uh, we sometimes talk about captions and the power of them, as you mentioned, like a caption would be very vital to this picture, right? You know, to give more context for why this is particularly important. How much control do you feel that the journalists have over the way their images are framed? I know they can physically frame them with the camera, but then how are they framed with the text that goes with it? 
because like one of the examples we circulate uh, or we talked about in class was from Hurricane Katrina that you might remember where the put yeah. that graphic together of people who are um, in, in having to walk through water with their belongings in a bag and then one caption says, you know, this guy looted and the other caption says these people found these things and their race is different. And so they're criminalizing, you know, um, the black person and then the they're not criminalizing the white people. And so I, I'm, and I don't know how much to kind of subscribe to the photographer themselves. There were no names. So you kind of get the impression the photographer wasn't able because of the water and the flooding to even approach them and really know their story or, um, and, you know, and so then we talk in class, like, well, shouldn't they, there'd be like a set word that's always used for everybody in a crisis, like found objects or not accuse people of crimes during a, a, a disaster like that. Anyway, but I just kind of don't know to what extent the photographer had any control over the way his or her image was framed. It depends. Um, it depends on who the photographer is working for. Um, and I, the image that you're referring to, I think it was Getty Images that used the phrase looter. Uh, so the photographer who works for Getty um, will file their images, you know, email in their images to um, the Getty portal or maybe direct to an editor if they're staff with Getty. And then from their decision, and the, their images will have the caption embedded in the metadata. They'll write what they want. But from there, the image will move across the Getty wire to whatever subscribers, whatever newspapers, whatever outlets subscribe, whatever people, individuals, subscribe to Getty. And depending on the co contract of your subscription, you don't have to use those captions. You can change the captions. Um, you, as the editor on a receiving end, can, because you might have in-house style at your newspaper that doesn't conform to how that caption was written, so you can change it. You can change words. The, the control of context is, pretty little for a lot of photographers. Um, I think even photographers who are, like if you're staff photographer with the New York Times and frequently it'll be a photographer reporter duo, I think you're much higher up the photo world chain. And even then there's gonna be an editor sitting at a desk far away in New York or DC who's making a, a final call on how your caption appears. So it's, it's, it's tough. Some of the um, photographers that are with top agencies, if you want to hire them for a story, they'll put things into the contract about keeping control over the wording. But that's also, I, ca I can't imagine a 25-year-old freelancer being able to make that demand. That's more the like 50-year-old, I've been doing this for a long time, I have all of these clips, and this is why you should hire me. That might be part of it. I don't know if that came up in your interviews with people about what bothers them. Like they're doing all this work and they really are trying to understand things and they hand it over to these other people who then have maybe different agendas or a different understanding and then it's misconstrued and then it goes on from there and their work might become the opposite of what they intended or something. Yeah, there's one photographer. He doesn't take it up in the book, but he considers himself a human rights photographer and an image that he took in Afghanistan because, again, he's part of, his, his archive exists through one of these agencies where you can just buy an image, was used um, for, I'm forgetting the name of the company, it's like some arms dealer. Oh, nice. <laughs> and they used his image and he's like, okay, this is a strange melding of who I am and how this is being used. So you mentioned the two journalists that were taken out of America. Mm -hmm. And, and how that is now kind of turned over to citizen journalism. And the constraints of that and also the challenges with getting that image out, you know, cutting the internet, et cetera, et cetera. So now that we're relying on the locals, how does that change our perception? This is a professional versus this is a citizen. And do we treat it with more credibility? I mean, on the specific case of Mariupol, I actually don't even know how much citizen journalism is coming out because if you don't have a satellite phone, you're not moving information. So they don't have TV, there's no TV, there's no cell phone, there's no internet. Um, so you have to have a device that basically pings off a local satellite and transfers information that way. That's a pretty specific piece of gear that most citizen journalists don't have. Um, but if we think about other examples, like Syria, 
also, like all, all the foreign journalists were pulled out at a point because it was too dangerous and people were dying and it fell to locals to cover. Um, I, I think it's, there's pros and cons, right? I think one of the cons is, and a lot of the, um, a lot of the individuals who took up the role of journalists were college students. They started initially with helping the foreign journalists, uh, acting as their translators and their drivers. The foreign journalists got pulled out and the college students were kind of now part of this local journalistic community. It's really dangerous. Um, as you know, I'm always kind of focused on like security issues. But in terms of the coverage, it's, it's an interesting thing. On the one hand, I would never want a situation where you have no information coming out, right? As I said before, that's like, that's really, really bad. On the other hand, it's even just going to your question about post-production, if you have no training in journalistic guidelines and ethics, it's really hard to know what to do with the images. And the only time that wire services were using that kind of imagery, they had to, they, it, they put together a lot of resources for vetting the imagery um, and looking at metadata and looking at Google Maps. Did, was it really taken here? Do the shadows like correspond with the time of day that they say it was taken? They, they were doing a tremendous amount of forensic work before moving those images forward. Or they would always have to caption them as photo by citizen or video by citizen journalism because you just, I, you just don't know. Um, and one of the interesting things that got taken up in my conflict book is photographers will talk about being at front lines and now it's the digital age, right? So we all have cell phones. And you'll see combatants firing guns and then putting their guns down for a second and taking pictures and then uploading these pictures. And this is, it's the kind of heavy duty, more heavy duty version of protesters who are documented, like you're an activist. Traditionally, according to journalism, you're supposed to not be involved in the story. This is a kind of also a changing conversation about how journalism works and how it should work. I think it was a little bit of a circular answer, just giving us things to think about, as opposed to. I mean, I think we, I think we should, we should have citizen journalism. I would, it would be a much worse world if we didn't have. Like, we would not have the George Floyd video. As horrific as that video is, it changed the course of history.